Okay, welcome back, folks. Uh, this, this is August 1st in northwest Louisiana, and it's downright chilly. You can see it's raining a little bit. This is so unusual for us because we're normally at 102. I think it's probably about 65 degrees. But uh, I'm filming sort of in the rain just to keep on schedule here. This lecture is going to be uh, chapter 3 of the textbook, so it'll be week 3A. And the topic of discussion today is the external environment that the firm or groups of firms are in. And if you go to slide four, uh, you can see the various learning uh, objectives uh, for today's lecture. And if you go to s uh, slide six, uh, the environment really is that which is external to a firm. And there's gonna be two kinds of environment that strategists uh, need to be concerned about. One is the general environment, sometimes called the macro environment. And this is where we find all those overall trends, uh, social, technological, demographic, economic, what have you. Uh, and this is a very important uh, aspect of the external environment. The other kind of environment is what we call the competitive environment, and that's the particular industry that a group of firms are in. So in a couple of slides, we're going to just use the example uh, from the auto automotive manufacturing industry. So you, you may not know, but industries in the United States uh, are grouped, and they all have what's called a standard industrial classification code. Uh, so you can look those up anywhere from manufacturing to retail. All have codes, and you can find uh, the various established firms that are within each industry. So why does the external, that which is external to the firm matter? We know in strategy that the, those external conditions partially determine what a company's strategy framework will be. In other words, uh, a top management team or even an entrepreneur thinking through an idea cannot think through an idea in isolation of all of these factors in the general and the uh, industry environments. Of course, we have to worry about the customer, right? Everything starts with the customer, and we'll see that that's one aspect uh, of an industry. But uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of things that we need to be mindful of now and to be mindful of going into the future. So the environment obviously provides resources, those input resources. If we're making carpet metals, uh, we need to have aluminum, uh, you know, as, as an input resource. Uh, the people we hire in, into our firms are all uh, part of that environment. And so the environment gives firms opportunities, but it also gives them huge threats. Uh, so a good tool and it's, this has been around for years, to analyze and help keep track of the general or macro environment is called a pestle analysis. And it simply allows us to organize uh, our scanning of the external environment into groups. And I'm going to go, starting with slide um, nine, uh, we'll go through each of the, uh, the pestle acronyms and what it means. So the P is political factors, and you can see such things as tax policies, trade restrictions, tariffs, all those kinds of things. Economic factors, those are general economic factors. Interest rates, inflation rates, gross domestic products, those kinds of things. The S is social, and social factors, uh, and that has to do uh, with a whole kinds of variety of things um, that uh, uh, we need to be mindful of. And social factors uh, differ by state in the United States, they differ by region, and then social factors also differ globally. Um, so it's a huge area of analysis. T is, is for technology, that's the general rate of new product development, the general changes in technology, and I think we would have to agree that we are in a period of very fast change in technology, and that is expected to be the same going forward for many years to come. Uh, e uh, are in, in 
and this is kind of a, maybe a little confusing, the E is environmental factors, but in this case it's things like natural disasters, weather patterns. Um, so we've called you know, about the general environment, and we've talked about the industry environment, but the environmental factors here uh, have to do uh, with the, those two examples, nat natural disasters, weather patterns. Um, temperatures, you know, all that kinds of stuff can, can, uh, can be an issue. Look at in wintertime uh, of the, what happens to the airline industry when there's bad weather. It, it it's, creates havoc. Uh, L is for legal factors um, and the whole legal environment of business is why we have attorneys. So from, from the pestle analysis we can develop a view of, and this is called a force field analysis, is which factors are helping us and which factors are hurting us. And uh, sometimes they are portrayed, I'll, I'll do a little whiteboard on this when we talk about 3B, the lecture in 3B, the more advanced lecture, uh, to where we get a picture of what is the situation that we're facing. Are, are we facing a lot of forces that are hurting us and only a few forces that are helping us or vice versa? And we need to understand where they are now, but more importantly for the strategist, what they will be. There's a whole professional organization called the World Future Society, which keeps up with forecasts in these various kinds of factors under the, the PESTLE um, um, name. I would add, by the way, uh, to PESTLE one other thing, and that's global issues. Um, you know, we're, we're, this is getting to be a, a global environment for uh, m most of our businesses now. Even, even a business here in Shreveport, Louisiana cannot be totally unworried about global issues. Okay, so, so going from the general to the macro environment, let's talk about the industry environment. And here is, we're uh, on slide 15, uh, is the classic five forces analysis. And it was uh, first written about by Dr. Michael Porter of Harvard in 1979 and followed up by a landmark book in 1980. And what we're going to see is, and we're going to have much more detail in 3B lecture, uh, any industry member of the SIC code is made up of, of these, these five forces. In other words, these five forces operate and as the bullet point says, they tell us how much profit potential is in an industry. And really, what, it, what it, it helps us analyze is what is the average industry return on invested capital. So take all, let's say we've got 10, 10 companies in an industry. We measure each firm's return on invested capital, or what's called ROIC, and we simply average those. The average for pharmaceuticals is about 40%, real high. The average for airlines is about 5%, real low. So you can see the nature of these five forces determines the average industry return on invested capital. And it's important to know that because as a strategist, we would like to be operating in industries that have a high profit potential as opposed to, let's say, the steel or the airline industry where that profit pool is very small. It's not to say that an individual firm cannot be successful in one of those, you know, in, in airlines. Southwest Airlines is very successful. But these are factors that, that we need to know as a strategist. So what are the, what are the uh, five forces? Slide 16 shows uh, a, a usual chart in 3B. I'll show you a slightly different version of this. But let's talk about this then. The potential em entrance going to, um, it's not marked, but it'd be slide 17. Are, so let's say we've got the big, what, four or five automakers. GM, Ford, um, gosh, who else is in there? GM, Ford. Uh, and as the example shows, Tesla is a new company in hybrid cars. Well, that would be an example of a potential new entrant. In fact, they have made an entry into the industry. And, and sometimes new entrants are good and sometimes new entrants are bad in terms of uh, helping or hindering that average industry return on invested capital. 
We have suppliers to that industry. An example here, Lear Corporation produces interior systems and they sell to all of the, the big four manufacturers. Uh, next, uh, we have the, what the slide calls industry competitors. I like to, to, to um, refer to those as existing players in the industry. So it's, I can't think of them all. It's, uh, you know, it's Ford, General Motors, and Tesla, plus others I can't, I can't think of right now. Uh, I will for 3B though. Uh, buyers are, are uh, another force. And those are the people that buy directly from an industry. In this case, the buyers to the automotive manufacturers will be the auto ship dealers. And as the, as the slide says, of course, we have to think through end users as well, you and I who, who buy automobiles. So uh, usually the, what we analyze here uh, is who are the channels and then also who are the end users as buyers or customers. Uh, you remember from 1B, we, we've already discussed this a little bit in our triple E or the extended enterprise environment. Uh, lastly, substitutes are a huge force for an industry and those are products or services that serve the same function but are not in the industry per se. So. General Motors is not a substitute for Ford. Those companies are analyzed in the existing player force. Uh, substitutes for this example would be bicycles, mass transit, motorcycles, by the way, uh, have emerged in the last five or six years as tremendous substitutes for automobiles. So these five forces, and we'll talk a lot more about it in 3B, these five forces depending on how they're configured, actually determine the average industry return on invested capital. Bet you didn't know that, did you? But it is a true fact. So the slide says, which I kind of disagree with, the, uh, there's a limitations to five forces. It assumes that competition is a zero-sum game, that the amount of profit uh, potential is fixed. This is just not, not simply not true. When Starbucks entered the retail coffee industry, Starbucks grew the entire profit pool for the entire set of competitors in that industry. And uh, it is true that collaboration as a possibility, we'll talk about collaboration, those kinds of things in Chapter 7, uh, tends to be downplayed. That is true. That is, that is uh, somewhat true because the five forces looks at competitive intensity and not other tactics that we could have what we call collaboration, which would be joint ventures, alliances, those kinds of things. We'll talk about that in chapter seven. Lastly in the chapter, they talk about strategic groups. Well, you remember in 1B, part two, I think, we talked about the PPF, or the Product and uh, Productivity Frontier. And you remember I mapped uh, on the curve J.C. Penney and Coles being very, very close to each other, those would be members of a strategic group. Uh, this helps us to narrow uh, the focus to closest rivals and, and allows us to focus in on who our competitors are. Remember in that discussion, in the upper uh, left-hand part of the curve, I put Neiman Marcus. In the bottom right-hand part of the curve, I put Walmart. Those two are not in the same strategic group at all and do not really compete against each other. So the last slide then just shows a picture along two axes, breadth of menu and perceived quality uh, in the restaurant industry and how we might uh, set out what's called a strategic group map. Uh, we're going to try to do this for the uh, integrative case as one of the skill builder assignments. So the key to this chapter, the key takeaway is all of these forces in the general or the macro environment, in the triple E, and in the industry environment, there has to be very keen analytics, and usually you'll find that in the strategic planning department of a company, they keep up with all of the trends and, and, and issues uh, around those forces and factors in the external, external environment. Okay, so thank you a lot, and stay tuned for 3B.